live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering AWS reInvent 2019. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services and Intel, along with its ecosystem partners. Well, welcome back here to AWS reInvent 2019. Great show going on here in Las Vegas. We're at the Sands, we're live here on theCUBE. Once again, covering it from wall to wall. We'll be here until late tomorrow afternoon. Dave Vellante, John Walls. We're joined by, joined by uh, David Chikotis, who is the Vice President of Product Management for Hybrid IT at CenturyLink. David, good to see you. Good to see you guys. And Brandon Sweeney, who is the SVP of Worldwide Cloud Sales at VMware. At Brandon, VMware. good to see you. Good to yeah. be with you. Now, uh, this is going to be a, uh, a New England sports segment, actually. I'm surrounded <laughs> by a bunch of Patriots, <laughs> Bruins, Celtics, Red Sox I fans. I love it. ESPN in Vegas. I just right. want right. to remind you, the Washington Nationals are the reigning World Series champions. Leave <laughs> yeah. it at that. Well Congratulations, well by the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, enjoy yeah. the moment. Yeah. Enjoy yeah. the moment. That's a little bit. Believe me, I know. Snapshot. Baby shark forever. Moment in time. I got that. Yes, amen. First off, let's talk about your relationship you know, yeah. between uh, VMware and Citrine Lake and what brings you here at AWS, the offering that you're putting together to run on AWS. Yeah, Brandon, yeah great question. You, Maybe I can jump in and then we can jump we in go, first. Yeah. So look, VMware, a long time player in the infrastructure space, obviously incredible relationship with AWS. Customers want to transform their uh, operations, they want to move to the cloud. We have VMware Cloud on AWS, and we continue to take tremendous ground helping customers build and build more agile infrastructure. Make that happen, VMware was built on our partners, right? Centrally, great partner, MSP. And when you think about helping customers achieve their business outcomes, key partners like CenturyLink make it happen. You've been a long-term partner and done a lot of great things with us. Yeah, and, and really what, uh, what CenturyLink and VMware have done, I mean really we sort of created the, the managed private cloud market um, in the early days of, of managing VMware solutions for customers. Uh, but really, where, and where we differentiate and in either working with VMware on uh, AWS um, is really with, uh, with elements of our network the ability to take those kinds of solutions and make sure that they're connected to the right networks and that they're, they're tied in and integrated with a customer's existing enterprise and, and where they want to go as they start to distribute their workloads more widely. Um, because we run that network, we see a lot of the internet traffic, we see a lot of threat patterns, we see a lot of things emerge with our cybersecurity capabilities and managed services, so we add value there. And because of that history with VMware and, and you know, sort of creating that hosted private cloud environment, um, we're there's a, there's a lot of complexity friendliness inside of our service offer where we can manage VMware, we can manage it in a traditional model that is vCloud verified, and then we can manage it uh, as it starts to move onto the AWS platform because as we all know, and as even uh, you know, Andy has re referenced in, in different points, uh, there's a, just about every kind of workload can go to AWS, but there are still certain things that can't quite go there, and building a hybrid solution that basically puts customers in a position to innovate um, is what a hybrid solution is all about. And that kind of moves the needle on some of those harder to move workloads. I mean, VMware is such an obvious place to start. But so you're trying to preserve that existing customer, VMware customer experience, but at the same time you want to bring the cloud experience. So uh, how, how is that evolving? Yep. Yeah, so, so a couple things, all right, so ultimately customers, they all want to move to the cloud for all the reasons we want, security, agility, governance, et cetera, right? But fundamentally they need help. And so partners like CenturyLink help figure out which workloads are cloud ready, right, and figure that out. And then two, you get to know the customer really well because of the relationships that you have. Right. And you can help them figure out which workloads am I going to move, right? And then that leads into more relationships on how do I set up DR? Right, how do I offer other services through AWS against those workloads? Yep, there's a, there's a lot of things where being a managed services provider um, for a, a VMware-based platform or being a, a managed services provider for an AWS platform, there's a lot of things that you, you have in common, right? You know, first and foremost is that ability to, to run your operations securely. You've got to be secure. You, know, you need to be able to maintain uh, that, that bond of trust. You need to be auditable. Your, your, your operations model needs to be something that's transparent to the customer. Um, you need to not just uh, be a, about migrating workloads to the new and exciting environment, but also helping to transform it and take advantage of whether it's a VMware feature or tool or a next generation AWS feature or tool. So not just migrate and lift and shift, but then help to transform to what that, that downstream long-term platform can do. Uh, you certainly want to uh, be in a posture where you're, you're building a sense of intimacy with the customer, you're learning their acronyms, you're learning their business processes, uh, you're, you're building up that bond of trust where you can really be flexible with that customer, and that, that's where uh, the MSP community can also come in, because there's a lot of creative things we can do commercially, 
contracting wise, binding services together into a broader solutions and, and service level agreements uh, that can go and give the customer something that they could just get by going to each individual technology platform under themselves. So and those we, are ways where the service provider community really chips in. I think you're right, and when we think about helping drive customer success, the managed service providers, because of those intimate relationships with customers, we've had tremendous success of moving those workloads, driving consumption of the service, and really driving better business outcomes based on those relationships you have. Yeah. So let's talk about workloads. You guys, of course, remember Paul Moritz when he was running VMware. Yeah. He, he said, any, any workload, any application, he called it a software. Any device. Any device. Right? He yeah. called it a software mainframe. And then, and of course, his marketing people scrub that <laughs> from the parlance, but that's essentially what's happened. Mm -hmm. Pretty much run anything on, on VMware. I've, and I heard Andy Jassy uh, in the keynote talking about people, you know, helping people get off of mainframes. <laughs> and so, I feel like he's building the cloud mainframe, any workloads. But what kind of workloads are moving today? It's not, obviously he acknowledged some of the hardcore stuff's not going to move. And he didn't specif specify, but it's a lot of the hardcore database, OLTB, trans transaction high risk stuff. But what is moving yeah. today and where do you see that going? You want to talk about some customers? Yeah, so there's a lot of joint customers we have um, that, that I think you know, fall into that category. And in fact, tomorrow, um, on Thursday, we're actually leading a panel discussion uh, that really dives into some customer success uh, on the AWS platform that Centrelink and our managed services practice has been able to help them achieve. What's interesting about that, we have, we have an example from the public sector, we have an example from manufacturing and from, uh, you know, from, uh, from food and beverage. An example from the, the transportation industry and airlines. What's really interesting is that in all those use cases that we'll be diagramming out tomorrow, uh, we're, VMware is part of all of them, right? And sometimes it's because VMware is a critical part of their existing infrastructure. And so what we're trying to be able to do is uh, design, you know, sort of systems of innovation, systems of engagement that they're running inside of an, an AWS or a broadly distributed AWS architecture, but that still needs network integration, secure connectivity back to the crown jewels and what's kept in a lot of those workloads that are already running on the, on the VMware platform. So that's a lot uh, of what we, we see that a, a good deal with regards to uh, you're moving your sort of innovative workloads, your, your engagement workloads, some of your, your digital experience platforms. Uh, you know, we're working with an airline that wants to uh, start building up a series of initiatives where they want to uh, you know, be able to sort of sell vacation packages and, and be very creative in how they market and deliver those, pulling through airline sales along the way. They're going to be designing those digital initiatives in AWS, but they need access to flight, flight information, schedule information, logistics information uh, that they keep inside of their, uh, their, their VMware environment in the centralized data center. And so, they're starting to look at workloads like that. They're starting to look at VMware Cloud on AWS. Uh, VMware as it, as, as, as it in and of itself as a workload, moving up to AWS. There's a range of these solutions that we're starting to see. But a lot of it is still, there's, you know, Andy had the, the graphic up there. We're still in the very early days of cloud adoption. Um, I, I, we still see a lot of workloads that are moving to AWS that are in that system of engagement. How can I digitally engage with my customers better? That's where a lot of the innovation is going on and that's what a lot of the, the workloads that are running and launching are. And I mean, we're seeing tremendous momentum. I mean, ultimately we should take any workload and we should be able to move it to the cloud. Sure. Right, and do it in an efficient and speedy path. And, and we've got customers moving thousands of workloads. Right, they may decide over time to refactor them, but first and foremost, they can move them. They can relocate them to the cloud they can save a lot of uh, cost out of that. They can use the exact same interface or pane of glass in terms of how they manage those workloads, whether they're on-prem or off-prem. It gives them tremendous agility, and if they decide over time they have to refactor some workloads, which can be quite costly, they have that option. But there's no reason they shouldn't move every single workload they have is there to the cloud. Is there a disadvantage at all to, to if, if you're left with you know, X workloads that have to stay behind, as opposed to someone who's coming up and, and getting up and running totally on the cloud and they're enjoying all those efficiencies and capabilities. I mean, are you a little bit of a disadvantage because you have to keep some legacy things lingering behind or how do you eventually close that gap to enjoy the, the, the benefits of new technologies. Yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a sort of an old saying that you know, if, you're, if, you're an, if you're an enterprise, you know, that means you've had to make a lot of decisions along the way, right? And so, presumably those decisions added value to your enterprise or else you wouldn't be an enterprise. Right. So it really comes down to, yeah, to, to those systems of records, those legacy systems, 
we talk about legacy systems. The, the only in IT is the word legacy. I know it's a positive yeah, word. Only in IT is the word places. legacy. You're uh, right. uh, a pejorative, <laughs> right? You know, right. It, it, your legacy is what the value you've built up, and a right. lot of that, whether it's you know airline flight data or scheduling best practices or or critical crown jewels kind of data systems, uh, are, are really important. You know, it really comes down to if you're an enterprise and you're competing against somebody that is born in the cloud, how well integrated is everything? And are you able to take advantage of and pace layer your innovation strategy so that you can work on the cloud where it makes sense, you can still take advantage of all the data and, and intelligence you've built up about your customers. So, in talking earlier, you guys, it seems like you guys do see that, that cloud is ultimately the destination uh, of all these workloads. But you know, Pat, think about Pat Gelsinger. He talked about the, the laws of physics, the laws of economics and the laws of the land. So then he makes the case for the hybrid world. And Murphy's Law. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Murphy's <laughs> Law. But so that makes the case for the hybrid world. And, it's, and it seems like Amazon, to a certain extent, is capitulating on that. And it seems like we got a long way to go. So it's almost like the, cl the cloud model will go to your data wherever it is. And you guys can, I think, help facilitate that. How, how do you look at that? Yeah, so I mean, uh, uh, Part, part of that answer um, is you know, the, how much data centers are becoming sort of an antiquated model. Right? There, there, are, there is a need for computing and storage in a variety of different locations. Right? And there's that we've been sort of going through these cycles back and forth of, you, know, you use the term software mainframe and the, and the Paul Moritz kind of model of you know, the, the original mainframe decentralizing out to client server, now centralizing again to the cloud. As we see it starting to swing back in the other direction for, uh, towards devices that are a lot smarter, processors that are you know, finely tuned for whatever internet of things use case that they're being designed for, um, being able to put business logic a whole lot closer to those devices. The data, I think that, uh, this is what, um, one of the things that I think Pat said at, at uh, one of the VMwares a couple years ago, data centers are really becoming centers of data. And how are you able to go and work with those centers of data? First off, link them all together, networking wise, secure them all together, and then manage them consistently. I think that's one of the things VMware's been really great about, is that sort of control plane, data plane separation inside your product design that makes that a whole lot more feasible. Yeah, I mean, it is a multi-cloud and it's a hybrid cloud world. And we want to give customers the flexibility and choice to move their workloads wherever they need, right? Based on different uh, decisions, geographic implications, et cetera, security regimens. And I mean, fundamentally, that's where we give customers a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of flexibility. And then bring in the edge, and it complicates Edge, the, data center, or cloud. It's so right? maybe it's not a swing back, you know, because it, it really has been a pendulum swing. Mainframe, you know, decentralized, mm. swing back to the cloud. It feels like it's now this ubiquitous push yeah. Everywhere. The pendulum stopped. Yeah. Because there's, there's an equal it, gravitational pull between the power of both, of both holes. And compute explodes everywhere, you got storage everywhere. So, brings me my question of governance. Governance, security, and the edicts of the organization, you touched on that. So that becomes another challenge. Mm -hmm. How do you see that playing out, and what kind of roles do you play in solving that problem? Or in the idea of data governance? Governance, yeah. 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 I, I mean, the, the, the best way to think about, in our, in our opinion, uh, the best way to think about data governance is, to, is really with abstraction layers and being able to have a model-driven approach to what you're deploying out into the cloud. Um, and, and you can go all in with the data model that exists uh, or, and the abstraction layers and the, and, and the, uh, the, the model-driven architecture that you can build inside things like AWS cloud formations or inside things like Ansible and Chef and, and, and Puppet. There are model-driven ways of understanding what your application known state should be. And that's the, the foundational principle of understanding what your workloads are and how you can actually deliver governance over them. Once you've modeled it, um, and you then know how to deploy it against a variety of different platforms, then you're just a matter of keeping track of what you've modeled, where you've deployed it, and inventorying those number of instances and how they scale and how healthy they are. That's certainly, from a, a workload standpoint, uh, you know, I think the governance discipline that you need. In terms of the actual data itself, I mean, data governance uh, and, and where data is getting stored, there's, there's a, a lot of innovation here uh, at the show floor in terms of software-defined storage and storage abstractions. VMware's got a, a great software-defined storage capability called vSAN. Uh, we're working with a number of different partners within the core of our network, starting to treat storage as sort of a, a new kind of virtualized network function. Right, you know, so using things like SIFs and NFS and iSCSI as, as VNFs that you can run inside the network. We, launched, we had an announcement here earlier in the week about our CenturyLink's network storage offer. We're actually starting to make storage and the data policy that allows you to control where it's replicated and where it's stored uh, just part of the, the network service that you can add as a value add. Or even the metadata, the fastest path to get to it if I need to, if I prefer not to move it. 
Yep. Right, you're starting to see, you're talking about multi, this multi-cloud world. It seems like the connections between those clouds are going to be dictated by that metadata and the intelligence to, to know what the right path is. Yeah, and I think we want to provide the flexibility to figure out where that data needs to reside, cross cloud, on-prem, off-prem. And you can just hear from the conversation from David, the level of intimacy some of our partners have with customers to work through those decisions, right, and figure out how to move those workloads effectively and efficiently is where we get a lot of value for our joint customers. Yeah. I mean, it seems pretty fundamental to this notion of digital transformation. I mean, that's ultimately what we've been talking about. Digital transformation is all about data, putting data at the core, being able to access it, get insights from it, and yep. monetize. Not directly, but understand how data affects the monetization of your business. That's what your customers yeah, are doing. And I think we want to, sorry, because I, I think we want to simplify how we, you want to spend more time looking up at your applications and looking down at your infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? Based on all the drivers across the different business needs. And again, if we can figure out how to simplify that infrastructure, then people can spend more time on the applications because that's how they drive differentiation in the market, right? And so let's simplify your infrastructure, put it where it needs to be, but we're going to give you time back to drive innovation and focus on differentiating yourself. Oh, yeah. You know, it's interesting, the, on the topic of digital transformation, and, and Randy, you're so right, the sort of an interesting little pattern that plays out for those of us that have been in the service provider community for a little while, um, that a lot of the, the digital transformation success stories uh, that you see that really, that get a lot of attention around the public cloud like AWS, um, the, 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 the big major moves into going all in on the public cloud tend to come from companies that went all in on the service provider model 10 years ago. Right? The, the ones that adopted the idea of, I'm just going to have somebody do this non-differentiating thing for me, so that I can focus on innovation, are then in a better position to go start moving to the cloud. Right. As opposed to companies that have been downward focused on their infrastructure, building up skill sets, building up knowledge base, building up you know, career path of people that actually are thinking about the technology itself as part of their job description, have had a harder time letting go. It's sort of that first step of trusting a service provider to do it for you, leads you to that second step of being able to just leverage and go all in on the public cloud. Yeah, and customers need that help. Right, and that's where, if we can help activate moving those workloads more quickly, we provide that ability to put more focus on innovation um, yeah. to drive outcomes. Well, I know you were talking about legacy a little bit ago, and, and the, the negative connotation. I think Tom Brady, don't you? There's the legacy. There's a legacy. There's a legacy there. Legacy there. there. One yeah. more run, yeah. number yeah. seven, exactly. number seven. <laughs> had to, had to send him home smiling, yes. so I know trust. that yeah. would always do it. Back with more, we continue our coverage here live on theCUBE, where AWS Reinvent 2019.